we're trying a new filming situation. I, I wish you could see the tripod situation that this took to set up. It's not ideal. <laughs> This is, however, by far the best lighting in the apartment right now. So we're gonna roll with it. And you get to see my nice little plants that I just, I spent a fair amount of the day cleaning up and trimming and propagating and getting them all ready for like fall and winter. My name is Rosica, I'm the Midnight Reader. This is my booktube channel. I took a break from booktube for a little while because my health went to shit, though it has improved significantly. So I am going to attempt to do an entire summer wrap up. And you say, Rosica, that sounds really ambitious, but I'm going to tell you that I didn't read very many books because being ill really helps with not wanting to read. <laughs> this will be an accelerated summer wrap up. First up was Kim Ji Young, born 1982. Uh, the author is Cho Nam Ju, translated by Jamie Chang. This is a really unusual book. I had heard about this one a couple of times, I think, from the podcast Books Unbound and a couple of other like large booktubers who had read it. This book was originally written in Korean. It was huge in Korea. And from my understanding, it was like a big part of reigniting the conversation on feminism and sexism in Korea. It follows the life of a meant to be average female Korean named Kim Ji Young. Her life as she grows up as a kid and then eventually becomes an adult, has a job, gets married, has kids, all those things. But the interesting thing about the character and where the book starts is she starts having what can generously be described as psychotic breaks, where she starts to speak as though she is other women in her life. Like, her mother-in-law or her grandmother or her dead friend, things like that. But the whole book is in this sort of examination of how sexism invades, permeates, shames, shapes her entire life um, and how being female in Korea makes your life markedly worse in small and large ways. The book is written kind of in a drier style. It does an interesting thing where it includes footnotes like you would find in nonfiction, interspersed with like facts and statistics from like that particular year in Korea, talking about things like ab abortion rates or like how many females were assaulted that year. And so it, it tends to read a little bit like nonfiction, even though it is fiction. There's a twist at the end that sort of reveals why the style is so dry. But I thought it was really interesting. This is probably the closest thing to a, f a feminist book that I've read this year. If this interests you at all, four stars. Next up was a sapphic YA romance called The Henna Wars by Adiva Jagadar. This is an adorable POC YA lesbian love story <laughs> with plenty of henna. This book tried to have a lot of big thoughts on things like public outings, cultural appropriation through art, religious shaming, and cultural expectations for young females. Did it land all of those things? Mm, some. It landed some. Did I enjoy the heck out of it and it was a wonderful YA lesbian love story? Yes. Four stars. Next up, I read another YA POC romance, which was When Dipple Met Rishi by Sandhya Menon. This book explores two 18-year-olds who on the summer before college go to a prestigious tech camp in Silicon Valley. Dimple because she actually wants to be a tech entrepreneur and Rishi because he wants to marry Dimple. Enemies to lovers and friends to lovers happens as well as a fair amount of iced coffee and some a glorious shade at Silicon Valley tech bro culture. It does suffer from the strongest of I'm not like other girl vibes, but if you can put that aside and if you're just looking for a YA romance about the summer you turn 18 and thinking you really have your shit together, it's a snack. I originally gave this four stars. I think I probably would downgrade this now to like three, three and a half. It's not going to win any literature awards, but who cares? Next up, I read a graphic novel called Snapdragon by Cat Lee about a young girl named Snap who befriends the local town witch. But that's just the rumor uh, of Jax. Jax is meant to be this creepy old lady who has one eye, but in reality just sells articulated roadkill skeletons on the internet and 
is actually a witch. It has wonderful plot lines involving love, acceptance, and queer romance, as well as a lovely trans storyline. It is great and delightful and lovely, and if you're looking for something a little bit witchy this fall, this is the graphic novel for you. Five stars. Next was The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. I might be a little bit weird with Erin Morgenstern because everyone reads The Night Circus first, because it was published first. I read The Starless Sea first, and I love The Starless Sea. I love the world she built. I loved her lyrical writing. I thought she didn't really nail the ending 100%, but I didn't mind because I enjoyed it so much. I had sort of the opposite experience with The Night Circus. So The Night Circus is about these two magicians who are caught dueling each other with their magic for years and years as a byproduct of this greater duel that's occurring between two magicians. Like they are they are the pawns in this game. However, they fall in love and they wish to escape their crappy circumstances. However, I think that Aaron Morgenstern's writing, if you've ever read it, is like very strong on the vibes, okay? Like you have to really love the world she's building because she spends a lot of time building it. And I don't think that a black and white circus is necessarily my vibes. I, I think I'm more of a primary colors human. And I, I don't know. I just wasn't that interested. And even when she started paying off the twists, I was like, but my God, it took us 16 chapters to get here, which didn't bother me at all in the Starless Sea. But this one, I just found kind of like a bit of a slog to get through. I'm really sorry if you love it. It's fine. I, I don't know. Was I like not invested enough in the characters? Was it too long? It's unclear. I'm gonna give it three stars. I would say the writing is more in the four and a half star range, but for me it was a three star experience, so don't yell at me, I'm sorry if you love it. Next up I read Homicide and Hollow Hollow by Mia Manansala. I actually wound up reading this as a sort of a pseudo buddy read with my friend Jay from My Quarter Life Crisis. Um, she had read the first one and hated it, and I had read the first one and thought it was it was okay. It's described as a cozy mystery featuring a Filipino main character who sort of has to amateur detective her way through town. This particular mystery centers around the town's beauty pageant. Well, the main character is also dealing with PTSD from the last murder that she solved. There's a lot of food descriptions in this because the main character food is sort of her thing. She's like a baker and cooking and food is a big way that the author connects Filipino culture to the reader. Um, and I loved those parts. I love, if this was just like a, a cookbook, I think I would have loved it. <laughs> I think I landed somewhere around where Jay landed, which is that <sighs> I hate the main character and she's really boring and selfish and self-absorbed and not super nice to the people in her life. And I just wish this was a rotating narrator series. I wish I got to meet the other characters in Shady Palms who were solving mysteries because I just really don't like this character. <laughs> it had the same problem as the first book, which is that the whodunit just sort of fizzled out instead of being a great twist reveal. I will also give this one a generous three stars. Next, I entered Jane Austen July, as well as Sweaty Girl Summer Buddy Reads. And this is where my reading really hit another gear right before I crashed and burned. I read Persuasion for Jane Austen July. I read this with Novel Idea, whose channel I will link below. She's a delight. She was very nice and generous, even though I really slowed down on the reading. She pretty much blew through it like immediately. And then it was just like, tell me all your thoughts as you read along, which was a great way to read this book, honestly. This is one of the shorter novels written by Jane Austen. The story centers around the ignored and Elliot and her very flawed family who treat her poorly and her great lost love who she was persuaded from marrying. This is one of the easiest Austens I've ever read. It lacks like the more denser dialogue that you find in books like Emma or Pride and Prejudice. I really enjoyed the book. I really enjoyed the main character. I may make a video on this because I did watch Persuasion the movie and I know the entire internet and all Jane Austen fans agreed that it sucked and they hated it. And I totally respect that. And I watched it and I thought it was okay. <laughs> uh, not good, but I thought it was okay, all right? So I, I'm i going to save my thoughts on Persuasion because I think I would like to make a video where I talk about the book versus the movie 
if anyone out here finds that interesting. I did really enjoy the book. I enjoyed it very much as a buddy read and I gave Persuasion five stars. Next, I read The Switch by Beth O'Leary. Gina's Library volunteered to read this with me, which was also an amazing buddy read. Like, can I just say these channels are, have really wonderful people and thank you for like, for reading books with me. Was also very patient because my reading slowed down exponentially. <laughs> this book is kind of like The Holiday, which is probably my favorite Christmas movie. It tells the story of Lena, who is in her 20s, and Eileen, who is in her late 70s. Eileen is looking for love and she feels trapped in her small town. And Lena is still processing the death of her sister and has become estranged from her mom and is also working herself to death. Lena is forced to take a three month mandatory leave from work and they decide to switch places. So Eileen goes off jet setting to London and Lena goes to the British countryside. <laughs> it is the best. Um, I will say that I enjoyed Eileen's uh, side of the story much more and I would like to be Eileen when I'm 79. Please, that woman has such a vivacious life. I really enjoyed it. Beth O'Leary has really like a very sweet writing style. I find her romances to be very kind and sweet. I had really enjoyed her previous book, The Flat Share, and I very much enjoyed this one as well. Five stars. And then right about here in my summer, like mid-July, that's when I got really sick. So, <laughs> and this is the book that I failed on. So I started reading Emma by Jane Austen with one of my viewers, Rebecca Steinhardt, who doesn't have a channel, but freaking volunteered like a booktube hero to come read this giant book with me. Uh, because we both don't read huge butt tons of classics. I think it is the longest Jane Austen and it is a, it is a honker. And if you're not used to the language and the characters, like it's a lot to get through. Um, I think I made it probably like two thirds of the way through. I did really enjoy it and I, I loved doing it as a buddy read. So the world knows Rebecca frickin' finished the book and not only did she finish it, she finished it in one month and managed to check off Jane Austen in July. So I'm so frickin' proud of her. I still haven't finished reading it. At time of recording, it is September. <laughs> so I do wanna finish it. I will say that I think it was a slower book for me because I enjoyed the most recent Emma adaptation film more than I enjoyed the book. I'm not gonna call it a DNF because I'm not not gonna finish it, but it hasn't happened yet, guys. And then I didn't read for four and a half weeks. The great fun times of sleeping, being ill, and being in pain. I really tried to rally because I was flying to Alaska at the time which meant that I was spending about 13 hours on planes and in airports. I really needed something to do and I thought, why not start an audiobook? So the book I wound up reading, which slowly awoke me from my reading slump, was <laughs> from one of my very favorite authors, The It Girl by Ruth Ware. Ruth Ware writes thrillers and mysteries. I have read a lot of her other books and I always enjoy them. Uh, this was no exception. I actually think that I enjoyed the, the main character in this book even more than I've enjoyed some of her previous characters. The story is told from the perspective of Hannah, who was the roommate of the murdered girl, and it's told in two timelines. It's told in the time before when Hannah is at Oxford, um, and she's hanging out with her friends, and she's falling in love, and she's, you know, and they're getting in trouble and getting up to all the sorts of things that 18 and 19 year olds do when they go to college for the first time. And then it's told like 10 years later, as she's still trying to like carefully wade through the broken pieces of her life after her roommate's murder. Um, and it's about her with her husband. The instigating event is that the man who murdered her roommate dies in prison. Um, and when she, when he dies, she becomes convinced that he was perhaps innocent and her testimony caused an innocent man to die. Therefore, she starts to unravel the mystery of her roommate's death and pick at the loose strings to see if she really did send an innocent man to jail or if the real killer is still out there. It's a great book. I loved it. Five hard stars. I enjoyed the shit out of it and it was the perfect thing to wake me up out of a reading slump. And that's it. Those are the eight books I read this summer as well as the one that I almost 
almost red. Rebecca, I'm still so proud of you and so sorry. <laughs> My reading has definitely slowed down. I am starting to pick it back up again and I'm enjoying reading right now, which is, you know, pretty great. So. Those were my summer reads. Tell me if there are any that you think are interesting, if you read any of them, uh, if you have any good book recommendations to get out of a reading slump, because I will take those. See you next week. Bye.